Breaking news tonight, the Supreme Court agreeing to take up Donald Trump's case for presidential immunity. The court, in a one-page order, saying it will hear the former president's appeal in his federal election case. But the argument's two months away, further delaying the trial. Mr. Trump also losing his bid to pay only a fraction of his $454 million fraud penalty. Will he have to sell his properties? Also tonight, the wildfire exploding into the second largest blaze in Texas history. 850,000 acres burned, just 3% contained. Thousands evacuated, cattle fleeing a cloud of smoke. Our team in the fire zone. In the Midwest, the tornado outbreak across multiple states and the new storm in the West up to 10 feet of snow. The major announcement from Senator Mitch McConnell about his future after health scares. Hunter Biden testifying in the House GOP's impeachment inquiry into his father, his defiant message. The failed lethal injection in Idaho, a convicted serial killer on the table for 45 minutes before it was called off. What happens now? President Biden undergoing his annual physical as Michigan primary voters send a warning. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening. There is breaking news out of the U.S. Supreme Court tonight, which has announced it will take up the question of whether former President Trump can claim immunity from prosecution over whether he tried to unlawfully overturn the 2020 election. The decision likely delays the start of any trial on the case, potentially by months, taking it into the heart of the campaign season. Earlier this month, an appeals court panel ruled against Mr. Trump's immunity claim. Now the Supreme Court saying it will hear arguments in the case in late April. Mr. Trump argues that he has total immunity for his conduct as president. It's the latest stunning turn in the case against the former president as he moves toward the likelihood of becoming the Republican nominee for president once again. It's where we begin tonight with senior legal correspondent Laura Jarrett. Tonight, the U.S. Supreme Court deciding to weigh in on a critical issue that could make or break the special counsel's case against former President Trump, agreeing to decide whether Mr. Trump must be shielded from prosecution by claiming presidential immunity for the acts he took leading up to January 6. Those acts, the basis for the criminal election interference case he's now facing in federal court. The move further delaying any trial in the case, likely for months. And if Mr. Trump wins, the charges would be dismissed. Arguments now set for the week of April 22nd. An appeals court had ruled against him, saying former President Trump has become citizen Trump with all of the defenses of any other criminal defendant. But Mr. Trump hoped the Supreme Court would put that on pause, saying he was being wrongly prosecuted for official acts that happened while he was still in office. If you have a president that doesn't have immunity, he's never going to be free to do anything because the opposing party will always indict him as soon as he leaves the White House. The high court already set to decide another legal battle for the Republican frontrunner, hearing arguments last month over Colorado's move to ban him from the ballot. The justices sounding skeptical of Colorado's ability to disqualify him there with a ruling expected any time. And Laura, on another front, there's been a development in Mr. Trump's New York civil fraud case. Yes, Lester, an appeals court judge rejected his effort to delay paying that more than $450 million judgment. Mr. Trump's attorney saying today he may need to sell properties to cover that penalty, a remarkable acknowledgement that he may not have the cash on hand. As a result of today's ruling, he now has a chance to obtain a loan to post a bond. But if he can't get a bond and soon and pay the full judgment himself, the attorney general could move to seize control of his New York properties. Meanwhile, a source with direct knowledge tells NBC News that the judge overseeing that trial received a letter at his chambers today with white powder. Preliminary tests indicate that the powder is harmless, but this isn't the first threat against the muster. All right, Laura, thank you. Let's turn now to the volatile weather dominating the American landscape from wildfires raging across the Texas panhandle to tornadoes in the Midwest. Parts of the country have been whipsawed by record highs, followed by icy lows. Guad Venegas starts us off from Texas. And Guad, a rare winter wildfire has grown into one of the largest in state history. Lester, we're already seeing the damage left behind by the flames. It's still burning in some places here. Just so you can get an idea of the threat, the largest fire in Texas right now is less than 5% contained. It is growing so fast, it's on its way to approaching the largest fire in Texas state history. Tonight, 
the series of exploding wildfires tearing across northern Texas, leaving a path of destruction. Massive walls of fire incinerating homes, cars and businesses, and overwhelming first responders. Pull out, everybody, pull out. Flames surround roads as residents flee to safety. The Smokehouse Creek Fire, the largest of at least five fires in the Panhandle, now stretching more than 120 miles. With high winds behind it, I mean, these fires are just moving quicker than anybody can kind of get around at this point. The unfolding catastrophe fueled by strong winds, unseasonably high temperatures and dry grass, forcing cattle in Hutchinson County to run from the flames. Officials telling residents in the town of Fridge to prepare themselves as as many as 100 homes may be completely lost. At this angle coming toward us. Alta Hudson watched as flames destroyed homes in his neighborhood. There was a lot of smoke and a whole lot of heat. It was so hot that it, man, it was hard to breathe. Tonight, the governor issuing disaster declarations for 60 counties, urging residents to take all precautions to keep loved ones safe. So far, more than 850,000 acres, an area larger than the size of Rhode Island, already up in smoke. An unfolding disaster impacting lives at historic rates. Guad Venegas, NBC News, Fridge, Texas. Right there, funnel, funnel. Come. I'm Adrian brought us in the Midwest, where at least 11 reported tornadoes ripped through Indiana, Michigan, and Illinois late Tuesday. The skies got purple. You could see the tornado through our window. Attention, O'Hare, This is a tornado warning. At Chicago O'Hare, hundreds huddled in the airport's emergency shelter. 40 miles outside the city, a confirmed tornado destroyed this apartment complex. More than 50 people now homeless. One of the residents did state that when they were laying in bed, they actually did see the roof raise up and come back down. Incredibly, no fatalities. And it was just going in the circle and everything was flying around with it. And then all of a sudden, peace. Residents and first responders getting a true scope of nature's wrath. The dangerous storm also dumping heavy rain, golf ball sized hail, and winds across the region. It was howling. The winds were like going really fast. The unforgiving conditions now moving east, all part of a wild weather week for millions nationwide. More than 100 cities hitting daily record highs this week. To have this kind of dramatic swing that we're having with tornadoes and hail, and then immediately snow and single digit wind chills, that's what makes this really unique. A whiplash weather system and a path of destruction in its wake. And tonight, the National Weather Service is on the ground surveying damage like this. The weather roller coaster continues. Next, another climb. Parts of the Midwest reaching the 70s by Sunday. Lester? Adrian, thank you. And we are tracking yet another storm poised to leave at least five feet of snow in the Mountain West. Dylan Dreyer is here. Dylan, this is a pretty serious storm. It is at least five feet of snow. I mean, Lester, this is a monster storm, one of the biggest we've seen so far this season. And so far, we are seeing that heavier rain, even some mountain snow beginning out in the Pacific Northwest. This is a slow-moving storm, so it's going to last for quite some time. We have winter storm watches, warnings, even some blizzard warnings across the Sierra Nevada mountain range. As we go through the night. The rain will be heavy, especially along the coast from Washington down into Oregon. Once the snow takes hold, though, we're also looking at very gusty winds, which could ex uh, is the reason why we have that blizzard warning in effect. But across the Sierra Nevada mountain range, we could see five to up to 10 feet of snow. It will be very dangerous and nearly impossible to get through any of those mountain ranges, Lester. 10 feet. All right, Dylan, thank you. A stunning shakeup tonight for the GOP with Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell announcing he'll step down from that post, though he'll remain in the Senate. Garrett Hake has the latest. Tonight, in a stunning shift for Republicans, the most consequential and controversial Senate leader in modern history announcing he's stepping down. It's time for the next generation of leadership. Top Senate Republican Mitch McConnell says he'll give up his leadership position in November after an unprecedented 18 years atop the GOP and retire at the end of his term in 2027. At times, emotional. I love the Senate. It's been my life. It comes after the 82-year-old recently suffered two freezing episodes in public where he was unable to speak. <laughs> And he's also faced growing criticism from fellow Republicans who, unlike McConnell, have embraced Republican frontrunner Donald Trump. 
McConnell served with seven presidents, becoming a frequent foil for Barack Obama, whose appointment of Merrick Garland for a Supreme Court seat he single-handedly blocked, clearing the way for Trump to appoint Neil Gorsuch, part of a conservative reshaping of the courts, which became his proudest achievement. Later, falling out with Mr. Trump over January 6th, but voting to acquit in his impeachment trial. President Trump is practically and morally responsible for provoking the events of the day. The former president has taunted McConnell as a broken down hack politician. I don't know that I can work with him. And mocked his wife, a Trump administration cabinet secretary, as crazy and with racist language. President Biden paying tribute to McConnell today. And Gary, there's another major headline where you are tonight. It looks like a deal to avoid a government shutdown. It looks that way, Lester. In a bipartisan joint statement, congressional leaders just announced a plan to push back Friday's deadline by another week with the goal of funding half the government by then, the other half by mid-March, all of which taken together would avoid a shutdown. Lester. All right, Garrett Hake. Also tonight, Hunter Biden, the president's son, testifying to House Republicans today in his father's impeachment inquiry. Ryan Nobles joins us. Ryan, Hunter Biden had some pretty sharp words today. Yeah, that's right, Lester. Hunter Biden testifying behind closed doors that his father was not involved in any of his foreign business dealings, and he slammed House Republicans for what he called a, quote, partisan political pursuit of my dad. And Republicans are investigating whether or not the president was involved in what they describe as an effort by the Biden family to cash in on Joe Biden's political career. They point to testimony that Joe Biden joined a business meeting with Hunter Biden via speakerphone. Now, the impeachment inquiry is struggling to regain momentum after an informant who'd accused Joe Biden as being part of a bribery scheme was indicted for lying to the FBI. House Democrats say that is enough for the impeachment inquiry to come to an end. Lester. Ryan Nobles, thanks. And the president today undergoing his annual physical exam a day after both he and former President Trump won their primaries in Michigan. But as Gabe Gutierrez reports, the voters used their ballots to send a message to both campaigns. Tonight, despite huge victories in the Michigan primary, both President Biden and Republican frontrunner Donald Trump are facing warning signs for November. For Mr. Biden, more than 100,000 voters casting their ballots for uncommitted, a sizable protest vote over the president's refusal to call for a permanent ceasefire in Gaza. We're asking you, President Biden, to stop killing our families before you come and ask for our support. A senior Biden campaign advisor now saying the president shares their same goal, an end to the violence. And a new reminder of another hurdle for the Biden campaign. The president today making a trip to Walter Reed to get his annual physical. As polls show, voter concerns mount over his age, mental acuity, and physical fitness for office. In a letter released by the White House late today, his doctor saying he is fit for duty without any exemptions or accommodations, noting he is receiving new treatment for obstructive sleep apnea and recently had a root canal. The president was asked about his medical visit today. <laughs> While the White House was pressed why the 81-year-old president's physical did not include a cognitive test. The president doesn't need a cognitive test. That is not my assessment. That is not my assessment. That is the assessment of the president's doctor. Tonight, there are also looming questions for the Trump campaign for November. Despite sweeping the first five contests by wide margins, more than a quarter of Republicans still are choosing his rival Nikki Haley, despite her increasingly long-shot campaign. Haley in Utah today. The Republican Party used to be the party of fiscal responsibility. But what happened under Donald Trump? All that changed. Mr. Trump today saying Haley got trounced last night by 42 points, that people don't like her, and that she can't beat Biden. And Gabe, you're on the southern border tonight where we're expecting those dueling visits by both frontrunners tomorrow. Yes, Lester. Tomorrow, President Biden is heading here to the southern border for a rare visit. Former President Trump is also coming to another town along the border. A senior Biden administration official tells NBC News, quote, we welcome the split screen. Lester. Gabe Gutierrez, thank you. In 60 seconds, the failed execution by lethal injection in Idaho, sparking outrage and raising new questions about capital punishment, all as another man faces death tonight in Texas. 
In Idaho today, the execution of one of the nation's longest serving death row inmates was delayed after attempts at lethally injecting him failed. We get more from Liz Kreutz. Tonight, the execution of Idaho's longest serving death row inmate halted after several failed attempts to administer a lethal injection. It wasn't a difficult decision. It was the right decision. Serial killer Thomas Eugene Creech was set to be executed at a maximum security institution near Boise. Prison officials say the medical team made eight attempts in multiple areas to establish an IV line before pausing the execution. It was a vain quality issue uh, that made them not confident in their ability to administer chemicals through the IV site. Media witnesses describe how the 73-year-old laid strapped on the execution table for more than 45 minutes, at times looking over and waving at his family. His eyes started to fill with tears and I heard him sniffling. Creech, who was convicted of five murders, has been in prison since 1974. His failed execution coming just weeks after Alabama executed a man using nitrogen gas for the first time after an attempt using an IV also didn't work. In Idaho, there's a different alternative. At this point, Idaho law provides for uh, uh, execution by lethal injection or firing squad now. This latest incident, the same day another convicted murder was executed in Texas. Ivan Contu, who still said he was innocent. His supporters petitioned to stop it. They didn't believe me. Today they do. All this continuing to raise questions about capital punishment and the most humane way to perform an execution. Now, Idaho officials say Creech is back in his jail cell. They are letting the death warrant expire as they work to determine next steps. Lester. All right, Liz Kreutz, thank you. Up next, the new study linking marijuana use to strokes and heart attacks. What you should know, coming up. A health alert for you tonight. As the popularity and availability of legal marijuana grows, a new study is raising concerns about the potential risks to your heart. Ann Thompson has details. This new study makes it clear, smoking cannabis is like smoking tobacco, dangerous to your heart. Cannabis is not an innocent bystander when it comes to cardiovascular disease. The research published in today's Journal of the American Heart Association found people who use cannabis every day, primarily through smoking, had a 25 percent increased risk of heart attack and a 42 percent increased risk of stroke compared to non-users. This is one of the largest studies to look at cannabis and cardiovascular events, reviewing data from nearly 435,000 Americans. Dr. Robert Page of the University of Colorado School of Medicine says it has an eerie ring. I feel like we're going to repeat history uh, with cigarette smoking. These data suggest that this is a red flag. It's looking like it could be just as bad as smoking cigarettes. Cannabis is becoming more and more mainstream. 24 states now allow recreational use. There are specialty stores, cannabis sommeliers. In some cities, the aroma is inescapable. More Americans admit to using cannabis, 4% on a daily basis, 18% annually. Information Pope says patients need to share. Doctors are not police. They are here for your help. To keep up with our changing times. Ann Thompson, NBC News. And that is nightly news for this Wednesday. Thank you for watching, everyone. I'm Lester Holt. Please take care of yourself and each other. Good night. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.